So we've got a symbol, gamma. And in fact, this is the third pass we've made at gamma. We had a video on gamma, and then we made another one, which we un originally called Gamma Reloaded. So I guess even more unoriginally, we ought to call this one Gamma Revolutions. Gamma is this factor which comes up all over the place in special relativity. It's to do with, you know, when you have distances being squashed when things are travelling at close to the speed of light, the amount they're squashed by is this factor of gamma. When time becomes dilated, so time becomes extended when something's travelling close to the speed of light, the amount is extended by is by this factor gamma. So it's a very sort of fundamental piece of physics. So mathematically, gamma, this factor, is equal to 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So if you've got a, an object or a reference frame which is moving at speed v, then its gamma factor is this quantity here. So it's equal to 1 when something's not moving. If v is equal to 0, this quantity comes out as 1. And as v goes up, closest to, to, gets closer and closer to the speed of light, gamma gets bigger and bigger. Well, one of the things I said in probably the first and the second video was actually, if, if you want to derive why gamma has that particular form, it's actually not that difficult to do. And so when you do that, then in the comments underneath the video, quite a lot of people say, well, go on then, do it, do it, go on. Um, so that's what we'll do, we'll, we'll do it. Are you going to do maths? Not very hard. So the hardest maths here is Pythagoras' theorem. Square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. I promise, no harder than that. We need to back up a little bit and talk about special relativity to do this. The Fundamental principle in, in special relativity is that all reference frames are the same and you can't tell if you're, as long as you're not accelerating, so if you're just moving at uniform speed or stationary, the laws of physics are exactly the same. So if you're in a thing called an inertial reference frame, you can't tell whether that reference frame is moving or whether it's still, you'll end up, you know, if you were inside a closed box in there, whatever experiments you could do, you'll always end up with the same laws of physics. You won't be able to tell I'm moving and that guy's still or that guy's moving and I'm still. And everyone's sort of familiar with that, right? That basically, you know, if you're on an aeroplane, the laws of physics don't change. You know, if you drop something, it's, you know, if you spill your coffee, it still ends up on your lap. If you put something in the microwave, the microwave oven still works on the aeroplane. So the laws of physics are the same if you're moving at constant speed or if you're stationary. If you start accelerating, then obviously you can feel the effects of the acceleration. But as long as you're moving at uniform speed, it makes no difference to any laws of physics at all. Next part of the story is electromagnetism which is, says that, you know, so going back to Maxwell at the end of the, the 19th century, figured out these laws of electromagnetism, and from those he derived the speed of light. The speed of light turns out has a very simple form that is it's not in some sense a fundamental constant. If you know about electrostatics, how charges attract each other, if you know about magnetism, how magnets attract each other, then actually you can derive what the speed of light is. So the speed of light just comes from simple physics. It's not something that, you know, is just a made up number. It's actually, you can, put in some simple physics and derive what the speed of light is. That means that, because it comes from simple physics, that means that the speed of light has to be the same whatever reference frame you're in, right? Because it's just come from some simple physics and the laws of physics are the same whatever reference frame you're in. So whatever reference frame you're in, you should always see the speed of light equal to the speed of light. Now to get to the how we actually get to gamma. To do that, we have to think about clocks, because clocks are one of the things that get affected by you know, traveling close to the speed of light, that time slows down. And of course, if time's slowing down, that means clocks can, the speed at which clocks are going is going to change, but everything's going to change. You know, the speed at which radioactive decay occurs, the speed at which you age, everything is going to change. Just because if they didn't all change together, then you'd know there was something funny going on that suddenly, you know, I'm only living 15 years instead of 75 years, and therefore clearly something's changed with the laws of physics. So any clock you choose to use, all other clocks have to mimic its behavior. So in special relativity, when you want to derive this equation, you can kind of set up a rather special kind of clock, a thing called a light clock. And so instead of having a pendulum that ticks backwards and forwards, you know, one tick per second, you, what you actually have is you imagine you have a light source and a mirror. And what you do is you fire out a burst of light that goes up, hits the mirror, bounces back, comes back, and then you've got a little detector next to the mirror which says, whenever I detect some light, I'm going to send out another burst of light. So really, you've just got little bursts of light going backwards and forwards. And it's just like a pendulum clock in that sense, that actually it's sort of ticking backwards and forwards between there. And so you could use that to measure time. It's not a very sensible way to measure time, but it's a you know, perfectly good way of measuring time. And whatever time you measure with this light clock has to be the same as what you'd measure with your pendulum clock or your radioactive decay or whatever it is. All right, so now we need to think about what happens to such a clock. So let me draw a picture of it. So here we've got our light source, we've got a mirror up here, and we've got a little detector here. So in, you know, in simple terms, all you're doing is you're firing some light up there, it bounces back and gets detected, and then you've got a little thing that says, okay, whenever I detect some light, I'll send another pulse up, and backwards and forwards between these two. And we'll make this distance a distance h. 
And if our clock's ticking, supposing its period is tau, so it, does, it takes a time tau to go from there to there and a time tau from there to, to go from there to there. So which, that's analogous to like one second on a pendulum clock because a pendulum actually only completes a period every two seconds, right? Each, it goes one way for a second and then the other way for a second. So this is going to be a clock. It's probably, if it, we make it, you know, the trouble is if we wanted it to be a second between ticks, this thing would have to be 300,000 kilometers long, which is not terribly practical. So it's probably going to have a shorter tick, but we can write tau if we want that h in terms of the period is c times tau. So basically it's tau to get from there to there, tau to come back again, just like from a pendulum clock, one second to tick one way, one second to top. And that's what would happen, you know, if I had one of these clocks sitting next to me, or, you know, if I actually I was sitting in a rocket and I had one of these clocks along, along for the ride with me, that's what I'd see. But now imagine I'm watching somebody in a rocket, so I'm not moving, the rocket is moving relative to me, and they've got one of these clocks. And so they're watching it going tick tock and, and behaving in the way that we've just derived here. From the perspective of the person in the rocket, they're just seeing the light going up and down, but of course the rocket, from our perspective, is moving along, which means that the mirror is moving along and the light source is moving along, which means the light, instead of going up and down like that, is actually going like this from our perspective. It's going up and then coming down again. So if I just draw that, what's happening is from the, you know, the light's emitted at some point, and from our perspective, we're seeing this whole thing moving to the right, so actually what we see the light doing is instead of going straight up, we see the light heading off in this direction, hitting the mirror, because the mirror's moved to the right by the time it hits it, and then coming back down again, and of course by the time it gets back down to the detector again, the detector's moved to the right again. And so the light, instead of going straight up and down, follows a path like that. So it has further to go. From our perspective, that light's gone further. But also, the speed of light is the same in every reference frame. And so the light's got further to go, and it's traveling at the same speed, so therefore it takes longer to do it. So one of those ticks in our reference frame takes longer than it did in the reference frame in which the clock was stationary, just because the light's got further to go, and therefore it's going to take longer to do it. And we can fairly straightforwardly mathematically figure out how much longer it's going to take to do it. So let's go back to the picture again for a second. So this is still this distant h. That hasn't changed, which we've already said is equal to c times tau. That hasn't changed. That's our ticks that it would be. The light is now moving at the speed of light c, we see it moving, and it's going to take some time t to get where it's going, so the distance the light's travelled along here is the speed of light times how long it takes to get there, c times t. Great. And then remember this thing is moving to the right, it's moving to the right at some speed v, which means by the time the light has got to the top here, this thing will have moved the distance over here. How far will it move? Well, if it's moving at speed v and it's got a time t to do it, then the distance it travels is just v times t. And this is just a right angle triangle we've got here. And so we can apply Pythagoras' theorem, which says that the hypotenuse squared is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. So ct squared is equal to c tau squared plus vt squared. So let's just write that down. We've got c squared t squared, because we squared the whole thing. So it's squeeze squared tau squared plus v squared t squared. Now I need to do a little bit of magic to rearrange this formula. t squared is equal to tau squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared. And then I just take the square root of both sides that tells me that the time I measure in my reference frame is the time you measure in the reference frame in which the clock is stationary, divided by, and I've got to take the square root of the bit on the bottom, 1 minus v squared over c squared, which is just gamma that we defined before times tau. So the factor of gamma is how much time gets changed by, how much time gets multiplied by. So this is saying that the time we measure tat t is related to the time in the reference frame in which the, the clock is stationary, so we'll think all the proper time, by some factor. It's longer by a factor of gamma. So gamma is the, the amount by which the time gets stretched. And as, as promised, nothing harder than Pythagoras' theorem. So somebody approaching the tunnel, if this happens, it's not going to be such good news because from their perspective, the train is longer than the tunnel, which means either the front of the train gets chopped off or the back of the train gets chopped off or both. <laughs>